Brad Keithley, who's a former oil and gas consultant and attorney and also founder of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget, he uh, he comes in to discuss it with us. Today is no different. Good morning, Brad. How are you, my friend? Michael, I'm doing great. How are you today? You know what? Not not bad. Not bad at all. Let's talk a little bit about what what's going on out there. I was reading this article in the Alaska Journal of Commerce talking about the trustees of the permanent fund itself seeking an inflation-proofing bill. And there's a paragraph in here which kind of raises the hackle on the back of my neck where essentially they – they say, oh, the, 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 it's largely a done deal, that this whole, uh, this whole inflation proofing will be dealt with with the POMV legislation, which is expected to fully pass this next year. I, uh, I'm a little concerned about that. Well, we all should be concerned. Uh, that's a great article. For those that haven't read it, it was um, – uh, the dateline is last Wednesday's uh, Alaska Journal of Commerce. It's by Elwood Brimmer, and it's a uh, – to deep cut into uh, the permanent fund board's uh, decisions at their meeting earlier in the week uh, regarding uh, their recommendations to the legislature. One of those recommendations uh, was to uh, – they've consistently over the years recommended a POMV, percent of market value, draw, which is just a, a consistent percent of what the, uh, what the permanent fund uh, value is. Uh, drawn out each year, um, but they've ch the article talks about a change in their recommendation. Historically, they've been at five percent, uh, and as we discussed last week at this last meeting, uh, they recommended four point five percent. But Elwood goes right. on through the article to discuss where the POMV is, uh, sort of put it in context, explain it a little bit, and then in the middle of the article uh, has that paragraph that that you just referenced that says, quote, uh, uh, the POMV legislation is largely expected to be fully passed next year. That's frankly the first time I have ever seen that in print. It, normally the articles, or usually the articles, uh, over the past several months, particularly the past several weeks, have been about next year's an election year, unlikely for the legislature to take any permanent uh, 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 pass any permanent legislation regarding fiscal issues is going to be a campaign year. A lot of uh, a lot of the well, all of the representatives, ten of the senators, uh, ten of the Senate seats will be up for uh, up for election. Uh, some of the senators are running for promotions. Essentially, Kevin Meyer uh, and Gary Stevens are running for uh, lieutenant governor. Uh, there's rumors of Mike Dunleavy announced and then and then has stepped back for health reasons suspended his campaign, but but he's put his hat in the ring. Others may as well, but at least uh, at least 10 Senate seats are going to be up. So all the discussion has been about in the context of an election year, they'll want to be done early because they'll want to be out politicking. Uh, they won't want to raise up any you know public ire, so they'll try to get out with as little uh, in the way of permanent legislation as possible. And then in, that's what the context have been up to this article, and then this article hits and said uh, that the consensus seems to be that it'll be that the POMV will be POMV legislation, which includes a permanent permanent fund cut, a permanent permanent fund dividend cut, right. uh, will uh, will likely pass last year, next year. So I I talked to Elwood about this, uh, exchanged notes with him, and basically he said it's it's his sense of the consensus of of the legislators, they 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 want to be done with this. They're the first legislat legislature that has cut the PFD, um, and so uh, it, it's not a big step uh, to some of them to go ahead and make that permanent. Uh, they don't want to be put in a position of making ad hoc draws uh, from the. Uh, now that we've run, we're running through the constitutional budget reserve. They don't want to be in the position of making ad hoc draws from permanent fund earnings. They want to put some structure to that. At least some of them do. And he said uh, that seems to be the, the, the consensus sense uh, that he's getting, that they want to put some legislation around that, structure how they're going to make the draws, uh, and go ahead and make the, uh, and make the cuts permanent. That, to me, is, is, is hugely problematic. I mean, we have elections uh, uh, so that the people can speak on these issues, and and I had viewed this. I have viewed this coming election, the 2018 election, 
uh, for governor in particular, but for the Senate, Senate seats that are up and the representative seats are up, to be, in essence, a referendum on the PFD. I, I, I have expected people to take different positions as they go into the election cycle and to have the, that election cycle be a referendum on it. For the and and since they don't want to otherwise bring it to the people, let that be the way in which we have a vote on it. But this concept that they're going to do it uh, next next session, I think, is hugely problematic and and frankly fairly scary. I'm you know what I I look at this and and I mean, do you really think, Brad? And I, and I guess this is just me kind of spitballing it here, but do you really think that they're that tone deaf? Do you really think that there are legislators out there? who are that tone deaf to think that the public would not care about a permanent cut to the permanent fund dividend? I mean, do you, do you think that they would not remember that? I think, I think legislators, um, so, so they, they made their first permanent fund dividend cut. The governor made the first, first permanent fund dividend cut in 2016 in front of the 2016 election. In that same legislature, uh, in that same session, the Senate voted to make a permanent fund dividend cut. That was their first uh, piece of legislation. They did that in the 2016 elections. Kathy Giesel and John Coghill voted uh, to make that permanent fund dividend cut permanent uh, and voted for the, for the legislation the Senate had. It died in the House because, frankly, Tammy Wilson, Lynn Gaddis, and others stood up in the House and said, not on my watch, and, and killed the bill when it came over to the House. But the Senate had voted for it. So you have Giesel and Coghill going into the 2016 election, two, quote, conservative districts going into the 2016 election uh, who voted for the permanent fund dividend cut. They got reelected, and frankly, uh, in, in, in the 2016 election, and frankly, the message a lot of the legislators, legislators have told themselves out of that reelection cycle, out of that election cycle, was that cutting the PFD was not fatal, that they could do it uh, and still get reelected. Now, both Giesel and, and Coghill ran against Democrats who also were in favor of PFD cuts. So it's not a it's not a clear test about whether that was that was you know their stance on it was acceptable because there really wasn't an alternative presented in the in that election cycle uh, that took the other position. But nonetheless, the legislators have told themselves that that was the test, and they um, and 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 they passed the test, and so they can get away with it. In the same election, in the same 2016 election, Lynn Gaddis got defeated uh, in running right. for uh, to succeed Charlie Huggins, and and. That, as you dig into it, that race is about a lot of other things, not about the PFD cut. But Lynn Gaddis had stood firm in the House, said not on my watch, uh, blocked uh, with Tammy Wilson and others, blocked uh, the progression of the bill out of House finance, um, and, and, and really stood firm on it. She got defeated uh, in, the, in the subsequent primary. A lot of reasons for that, but the spin that, that the lobbyists and others down in Juneau have put on that is – Gaddis votes against the PFD cut, uh, permanent PFD cut, against the fiscal restructuring bill, gets defeated. Giesel and Coghill vote in favor of it. They get reelected. So they're, they're telling themselves a story that, that constituents, they can live through this, that constituents uh, uh, either don't care uh, or, in fact, are supportive of it. Um, and and that's, sort of, that's sort of the mentality that, uh, that exists down there when, they, when people bring up the constituent issue. Well, I mean, I, all I can hope is at this point, watching this whole thing come up, you know, I, I guess in a way, I hope that in, in some ways that this is the hill that some of these politicians decide to die on. Because quite honestly, the only way we're going to turn this around, in my opinion, is we're going to have to change the players. We have to change the players. I mean, there's just, there's just, there's no two ways about it. We can't. You know, we got the same group of people saying, oh, I know we got you here. I know we brought you to this point, but we'll fix it. I mean, you know, past performance is indicative of future results, and we're already seeing what's going on. And if they do this, that just kind of, that just kind of, uh, uh, you know, ices the cake, so to speak. And then we've got 40 representatives and 10 senators who are going to be up for election. And I hope that the, that this kind of vote or any kind of commentary that they make on this prior to election is just the stick that their opponents use to beat them into submission with. Well, I, I agree with that, Michael. But here's the deal. There's got to be opponents. 
I mean, part of the yeah. problem with Kiesel and Coghill uh, was that the the, the Democrat candidate there were there was no primary opposition, um, and and the Democrat candidates uh, that ran ran to to essentially do the same thing. I'm, uh, uh, they ran to, uh, they ran on a platform that included, you know, fiscal restructuring that included a PFD cut, basically the Walker uh, uh, platform, and and so there's got to be candidates. It's not going to do you any good. Peter Macecki, for example, down in the Kenai, uh, a senator that 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 has that has voted for PFD cuts, uh, voted to to cut the PFD in the uh, 2018 budget, the one that we're operating in now. Uh, voted not to uh, override the governor's veto of the PFD cut in the 2017 budget. Somebody who's led as majority leader of the Senate of the Senate Republicans has led the charge uh, for uh, making these PFD cuts uh, uh, permanent, uh, a permanent restructuring of the of the permanent fund earnings stream. Um, clearly, somebody who's out in front, Peter Merchecki, someone out in front on this issue, clearly a target. But to date, I don't I don't know of any candidate who's announced down in the Kenai uh, that they're going to run against Macheki in the in the primary, and I and I haven't seen a Democrat come forward uh, uh, in that in that election either. I'm sure there will be a Democrat, but whether they take a position contrary to Macheki's on the PFD, so you've got in order to in order for that stick to work, in order for to change the players, you've got to have candidates who take different positions. Uh, on these issues, running in those dis- districts, solid candidates running in those districts, and and to date we've not seen we're, we're seeing some of that surface. Um, William Weatherby announced uh, out in uh, Bryce Edgman's district out in Western Alaska. Weatherby clearly is a uh, is is somebody who wants to maintain the PFD as it is. Uh, we're seeing some of that, but we're not seeing a lot of it yet. Right. Uh, down to the last two and a half three minutes here, Brad. Let's take just a, a moment to once more analyze what it would mean if this POMV, if this permanent cut to the permanent fund dividend was enacted, what would the effect be on the overall Alaska economy, the private economy, not the government? We know the government will be taken care of, which seems to be the priority of all these people. What would the effect be on the private economy moving forward? Well, ICER has said, ICER, uh, uh, the, the, the best economic analyst in the state, nonpartisan, has said cutting the PFD has, quote, the largest adverse impact, close quote, of all the new revenue options on the overall state economy. It, it, re- it reduces uh, jobs more than any other alternative. It reduces income more than any other, other alternative. And ICER, in another analysis, analysis, has said cutting the PFD has by far, quote, by far, uh, the worst impact on Alaska families. So what we're talking about is worsening the recession. I mean, we're all the state's already in a recession. Uh, we have people hurting. We have poverty levels. We have joblessness uh, uh, going up. And what we're talking about in cutting the PFD, we're talking about worsening that in a way that, that is worse than any other new revenue option the legislature could come up with. And, and it's just – I mean, it, it makes the top 20 percent – their lives better because it has the least impact on them of any of the options, but it has the worst impact on the overall economy and the worst impact uh, on Alaska families of all the options. I, uh, you know, I, I would hope that there would be somebody out there that's listening to this, and I, and I hope I hope you folks are paying attention to this because this is the problem that we're going to have going up. If all we do is elect the same cadre of folks and we don't have good candidates to put up against them. You know, if you always do what you've always done, you're always going to get what you've always got. And what we're getting right now is bigger government, less money in the private economy, and uh, and this top-heavy thing that we've got going on right now. Brad, final thoughts before we jump into the next segment. Well, it, this, is, this is a warning sign. This article in the Alaska Journal of Commerce, Elwood is a great reporter. He picks up. He does, he does his homework. He understands what people are thinking. This article in the Alaska Journal of Commerce is a wake-up call. I think everybody had thought, a lot of people had thought, well, we'll just slide through it. We're going to head to the election, and we'll focus on this issue in the election. What, what this article says is, no, they're going to try to push it uh, in the next session before we get to the next election. Uh, and, and it's a wake-up call for people who are really concerned about this to get involved now and talk to their, be talking to their legislators and getting ready to face this issue in the special se- in the next session as opposed to waiting until the election. All right, Brad Keithley, we're going to continue on this. We're going to talk a little bit about 
Are you being played? That's uh, going to be kind of coming up next year. The Michael Duke Show, your home for Common Sense Radio. Brad Keithley is a former oil and gas council consultant. He's also the founder of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget, which takes excruciating pains to look at what's going on in the budgets of the state of Alaska, what's happening with things like the permanent fund, what the effect will be on the economy and the people of the state of Alaska. And uh, it's important stuff. And the big question right now is, working with Brad, is are we being played? And he's got a piece up on his blog, which you can find over at Brad Keithley's Thoughts on Oil and Gas on page two. And we'll post this up. Um, I'll uh, drop this link to Eric. So, Eric, uh, Eric, you got the link there in the in the thing. Go ahead and put this up on the Facebook page. Are Alaskans being played? Uh, Brad, let, let's talk a little bit about this. So I wrote the I wrote this I wrote a piece that uh, talked about uh, just what we were talking about before the break, which is that cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy, and is by far the worst uh, uh, option for Alaska fam families, alternative for Alaska families of all the new revenue options. Um, ICER analyzed this in detail and came to the conclusion that that even income taxes sales taxes, even property taxes, have a lower impact, a lesser impact on the overall Alaska economy, um, a less adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy than cutting the PFD. Cutting the PFD right. is the absolute worst thing you can do. So I wrote a piece that said, you know, look at all these people who are saying income taxes are our are, are last thing. We'll never cut income taxes. But they're doing something worse. I, uh, the Senate Republicans right. are doing something worse to the overall economy. They're cutting the PFD, something worse for Alaska families. So I wrote, I wrote that piece. And then I got a bunch of responses, understandably so, but I got a bunch of responses that said, oh, both are bad. Taxes are bad and PFD, uh, uh, PFD cuts are bad. We just need to keep cutting spending. And, and I thought about that for a moment, and, 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 and it dawned on me that that sort of mentality is exactly what the Senate Republicans and the others in the top 20 percent are counting on. Right. They, they've, been, they've been pursuing these PFD cuts, uh, permanent fund restructuring. They voted 12 to 2. The Senate Republicans last session voted 12 to 2, 12 to 2 uh, uh, against cutting spending further uh, and, and instead cutting the PFD instead of cutting spending further. They're not going to cut spending further. The Senate Republicans right. have given up. The but Senate they, Republicans but are, us, but they want us to be in this fight because if as long as we're fighting this, no taxes, all cuts, we're basically spinning our wheels. Meanwhile, they're behind the scenes in machinations, cutting all these other things, uh, you know, taxing us through the PFD, taxing through this other thing. They can still take the stand at being against the income tax or the sales tax or whatever and be heroes. Meanwhile, we're chasing our own tails out here saying there doesn't need to be any taxes. Exactly right. And, and, and essentially, Alaskans are getting played. They're getting they're getting told that we're going to be, you know, we're going to cut spending. We're against income taxes. You just need to go out there and support us to continue cut spending, and we'll be here to defend you. And and off to the side, they're doing the absolute worst thing for the Alaska economy. They're cutting the PFD, uh, the absolute worst thing for Alaska families. So they're 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 trying to shove everybody into this box of talking about additional spending cuts, not focusing on what they're doing on the new revenue side while they're doing the exact the exact worst thing on the new revenue side. And I, and I think I think they're playing Alaskans. I think I think they're saying, you know, you and I have talked about squirrel, right? The game of squirrel. Look right. over here. Squirrel. And and everybody looks that direction and goes, "Oh, bad" or "Oh, good" or "You'll know, get my gun and shoot it" or whatever. Whatever you're doing with the squirrel. Meanwhile, back over here on the main stage <laughs> is is where the is where the real act is going on. And right. and my and, and my increasing view is that is that the Senate Republicans, the governor, the House are all going are all playing a game of squirrel by saying, look over here, spending bad. You know, we're focusing on spending. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, they're doing the worst thing possible. Right. And then the rest of us, we're all out here circling the wagons and firing inward at each other over what should be cut next and everything else. And why are you having a debate, Brad Keithley, on a flat tax when we really don't need any tax? And, and they're over in the corner stroking their Van Dykes, cackling gleefully uh, because they're basically 
causing us to fight amongst ourselves over what's the best tactic to create the cuts when they know that the cuts are not coming. Like you said, 12 to 2. I mean, it's not coming. Yeah, we, we that I hate to say it because it shouldn't be the case. There are things like the Hammond 50-50 approach. There are plans out there that you can put in place, that people can, the legislature and the governor could put in place that would get us through this, this fiscal situation without having to cut the PFD or taxes. But they're not, gonna, they're not doing it. The House isn't going to make the cuts. The Senate voted 12 to 2 against the cuts. That debate is over. And if somebody wants to keep saying, we got to make more cuts, I agree with you. We've got to make more cuts. But you need to be talking about new revenue also. You need to be doing the analysis on new revenues. Yes, taxes are bad. I agree taxes are bad. Income taxes, since taxes, property taxes, they're bad. But they're not as bad for the overall economy and for Alaska families as PFD cuts. The only segment, the only segment of the Alaska economy that's helped by PFD cuts is the top 20% by income. They get off with paying, with suffering less than a 2% reduction in their overall income. The remaining 80%, it's at least double that. The next 20%, uh, the upper middle income segment pays 5%. The next, uh, average family of four. The next one pays 12%. Uh, the next one pays 15%. And the bottom 20%, they, pay, they give up 30% of their family income, every family of four, 30% of their income under PFD cuts. So what's happening is the, is the top 20% is saying, squirrel, look over here, bad things, spending, um, right. uh, income taxes, very bad things, while the legislature is doing their bidding by you know cutting the PFD, hurting the remaining 80% of Alaskans, the only ones they're benefiting is the top 20%. Well, and, and hey, would you take a 2.5% cut to your overall pay if you knew that the government uh, uh, larders and treasury was going to be thrown open to your businesses and all the causes that you support? Would you do that? Hell yes. I mean, that's the thing. You've got entire businesses whose business models are now based and baked into this government spending plan. Uh, that we're talking about. And we saw the Ron Duncans with GCI and all this other stuff trying to raid into the permanent fund earlier and all that's because their entire business model is based on the millions of dollars that they get from government. I mean, would you take a a thousand dollar or two thousand dollar hit out of your income to uh, to be able to have your businesses survive and thrive on all this government largesse? Hell yes. Yeah, exactly right. Um, and and especially if they can do it, especially if they can maintain spending and not have to pay for it. I mean, what the, what the PFD cut does is essentially say the top 20 percent, you get off with paying less than 2 percent of your income uh, to maintain uh, government spending for, for all of these programs. The bulk of the of the costs are shifted off onto the other 80 percent. So it's like it's having your cake and eat it, too. Right. You get to maintain high government spending levels. You get to maintain your business model that's based upon having those high government spending levels. And you don't have to pay for it because the costs are being shifted over uh, to the remaining 80 percent. It, it is it, it is it, it's a great strategy if you're, you're in the top 20 percent. It's a great approach. Um, you know, get somebody focused on the squirrel of, of cutting spending more, set them off chasing that. While over here on the side, as I say, over here on the side, you're you're unrolling a game plan that protects you, but but hurts the overall Alaska economy, uh, the largest adverse effect on the overall Alaska economy by far the by far uh, the worst effect on on Alaska families. It's I, it, in in the blog post, if people go and read it, they'll see that I've got puppet strings. Right? It I, I feel right. like Alaskans to some degree are, are getting treated like puppets by the top 20 percent who are are trying to manipulate this process to to have their cake keep keep spending high uh and eat it to not have to pay for it uh by uh, uh by by themselves having to pay uh any significant share of the cost sliding that back over on the remaining 80 percent all right coming down to the last four minutes brad so we see now i mean now we could see that you know hey this boy has strings on him we're we're, we're there we could see the forest through the trees. I mean, you and I even got caught up in this early on trying to make this argument that cuts were the answer, that we didn't need taxes before we made the shift. And we both took some heat for that. We both took some heat for talking about a flat tax and other you know, options that were out there. 
But now that we know and now that we see that this is the game that they're playing, what can we do to fix this? Well, people need to start. I mean, you, people need to start talking on need, people need to accept that we're going to have new revenues that that we, yes, we need to cut more, but that's not going to save us. The Senate Republicans aren't going to come riding to the to the day. So we need we need to be start start talking about new revenue. And then we need to focus on what's the best new revenue, best approach to new revenue. If we've got to go there, what's the best approach to new revenue from the standpoint of the overall Alaska economy, from the standpoint of Alaska families? And when you do the research on that, you find the the, the, the best approach, uh, the worst approach, you find the worst approach is cutting the PFD, uh, worst approach on the overall Alaska economy, worst approach on Alaska families. I think, and I've got a lot of stuff on the blog that explains this, I think the best approach is a flat tax, um, a, a, a tax that applies to all Alaska families uh, from the poorest to the richest and takes the same percent of their income uh, uh, across the board uh, to, to, to maintain government. The rich pay, uh, pay a fair share. Uh, those on lower incomes pay a lower amount, but they pay the same percent, uh, the same amount as a percent of their income. And, and if you broaden out the tax base that way uh, to, to the maximum uh, 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 base you can get, uh, which is adjusted gross, gross income of about $27 billion by the time you factor in non-resident income uh, being received in Alaska, uh, the tax rate to, to achieve uh, the type of new revenue that the Senate has voted for uh, is about 2.5 percent, much less, much less for the remaining 80 percent uh, than the impact of a PFD cut. In the, in the upper middle income, the PFD cut for an average family of four is about 5%. We're talking about a 2.5% tax. In the middle 20%, the middle income families, uh, the effect of a, of a PFD cut is about 12%, 8 to 12%. Um, the flat tax would be about 2.5%. The only group that pays a little bit more is the upper 20%, and they go from less than 2% under a PFD cut to 2.5%, the same flat tax rate as everybody else. But everybody pays the same rate. From the richest to the poorest, everybody pays the same the same 2.5%. That has one other positive benefit. It gives everybody an equal stake in government. So when, when government talks about spending another $10, 2.5% of that $10 is going to come out of everybody's pocket. Instead right. of, un, under the PFD cut, most of it coming out of the middle and lower incomes, or in the case of a progressive income tax, most of it coming out of the upper incomes, it comes out of everybody's pocket. So everybody yeah. has an equal stake and an equal hit. And then we can go back and start looking at government. But we've got to get this argument behind us and move forward from here. Brad Keithley, we're out of time. Want to uh, remind you that there are some great folks.